Hello. Oh, yes. okay. It's live now. Okay. Let me try again. All right. Good afternoon. <laughs> We're excited to be here today. Um, I think we'll just do a quick round of introductions um, and we'll get started in just a minute. Thank you to all who are joining us. My name is Norma Cram. I'm a vice president and chair of the cybersecurity, privacy and digital innovation practice at Van Skoik Associates. I work across Fortune 500 and fintech companies and all things blockchain and cryptocurrency. I also focus on that nexus between systemic risk and new technology. So having started a cybersecurity practice in 2005, this is the perfect topic for me to talk about. Um, and prior to that, I worked in the U.S. government like many others. I worked at the U.S. Departments of Commerce, State, and Transportation. Uh, spent a lot of time with the G7, G20, and the OECD and other global countries and what a policy and a regulatory regime should or could look like for digital assets and cryptocurrencies. Stephen? We're waiting for Stephen. Okay. But I'll take it next. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. that's okay. Hi, uh, my name is Dave Jevons. I'm CEO of CypherTrace. We perform blockchain analytics across hundreds of different cryptocurrencies and digital assets. We work primarily with um, financial institutions, um, cryptocurrency companies, and government agencies to help them understand uh, regulatory controls, restrictions, reporting requirements. We provide them all the tools to do their anti-money laundering, uh, their Bank Secrecy Act compliance across cryptocurrencies, and um, and also to manage risk across all of the different counterparties in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And if things go wrong, we provide a full suite to investigators, regulators, and financial crimes specialists to perform investigations on cryptocurrencies to find who are the bad guys or where did the money go. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, our company was recently acquired by MasterCard, the credit card company, um, but they're so much more than credit cards. MasterCard's a multi-rail payments company around the world. As you can imagine, the events of the last uh, week um, in Ukraine and Russia and all around the world have, have been of uh, great importance to us at CypherTrace and at MasterCard. Um, and it's great to be working with a team of blockchain innovators and folks who've been working on central bank digital currencies as far as sandboxes for banks, working on stable coin policies. Um, so by putting our side on the crypto regulation together with the whole MasterCard payments infrastructure, I think we've, we've got some real insight into what's happening in the market. And it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with everybody for this uh, panel session. Cool. Thank you. I guess I'll take my turn then. Yep. Uh, my name is Lee Shu. I'm from uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm the founder and the managing partner for LXI Consulting and also LXI Capital. So LXI Consulting is a platform built by investor for investors in the renewable and computer space. Uh, during the course of the years, um, we found there's a lot of um, challenges uh, managing all those investment assets uh, as a uh, institutional investors. So we built a platform uh, focused on helping to uh, manage those uh, assets in a more efficient way. So we are mainly focused on the financial financial operation, uh, operation finance, um, and also capital markets. And then uh, for renewable, we also focus on the uh, project finance as well. And market-wise, we mainly focus on US market and also the uh, Asia Pacific market. And then, uh, yeah, so for crypto-wise, uh, because our renewable background, we're particularly uh, uh, focused on the uh, crypto mining and also um, uh, my personal background is also related to security exchange. So we work with a lot of uh, um, uh, crypto company with, with, with exchange uh, operations. Can you guys hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We actually right, just perfect. started. It's okay. We've just started and we're going around doing self introductions. Yeah. So I'm down with my part. Yeah. I think. Uh, Josh Okay. Joshan, yeah. yeah. Let me just finish my introduction, my and then uh, Stefan, that you can just take over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry guys. And uh, uh, you know, yeah, from here I'm listed as the president of Intel for good, and I actually now just uh, 
I, I'm with uh, uh, Amazon Web Service, and um, I'm in the federal financial team, and we work with the central banks, uh, miniature finance, and all the financial regulators, helping them to just address their, you know, digital transformation related uh, challenge. And uh, one specific focus, uh, you know, I have within the team is uh, digital asset and the central bank digital currency. And uh, currently, that's uh, we are working with many central banks worldwide. Uh, uh, helping them to understand, you know, how to mapping the uh, policy objectives with the technology options and also uh, how to just launch a CBDC system, which, uh, you know, meets the performance uh, criteria and uh, make make sure that they can leverage uh, CBDC to deliver the result they're looking for. Thank you. You're muted. Oh, uh, yeah, you made it. We can't hear you, Stephen. Um, we cannot hear you. There we go. Okay. I said I apologize. I have three new computers, and none of them were running. Run the world. They all. They all had to be updated. So, um, who else has gone on introduction? Did I miss? Anybody? Oh, we finished. We, we finished. finished. Yeah. You you finished. All right. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, then from, from the CDB standpoint, I want to start there. I have some questions from uh, each of you guys, but there, there's a lot of conversation around. Let's start with something basic that anybody wants to take. There's a distinction between stable coins and central digital banknotes. There's sort of different purposes and different usages. Does anybody want to take an explanation on, on what the differences are between stable coins and central digital? Sure, I'll take a quick stab. So stable coins are operated by private companies. Um, they uh, are ostensibly are pegged to a single currency, whether it's the US dollar or the euro, or in some cases you could create a basket um, and say it's priced against that. Now they are private companies. Um, they are, have a charter that may say I have reserves to back up these, um, you know, the dollars, let's say that I put out into um, let's cut, say maybe Tether, for example, um, getting audits out of those out of those companies has proven to be challenging. And sometimes, you know, if the price floats up then they really don't have the reserves, so they have to burn. So there's a there's never really a one to one peg. It's just a, it's the company's best effort to say one of my tokens is worth one U.S. dollar. Whereas a central bank digital currency issued by a central bank, it's not indexed to the dollar, it is the dollar. So there's never any float or anything like that. It's always the same thing. And it's pegged to however the U.S. dollar is pegged, which, of course, it doesn't necessarily have assets behind it either. But um, it has the weight of the U.S. government in the U.S. case and same for every other country. So you got a lot less risk if it's centralized as far as you know, currency flowed versus what you're trying to peg against. But there are plenty of other risks of having a centralized system around privacy and security. Yeah. And for me, the biggest difference is that, you know, one is the private money, the other is the public money. And for the private money, that's, it's, you know, um, basic, it's not on central bank's balance sheet. And uh, the core, you know, uh, differentiation of a central bank digital currency is that uh, it is on um, central bank's uh, balance sheet. So let's, and I want to, I'll move across you guys because Norma, I want to talk to you on some of this. If, if a bank were to issue a debit card, a debit card is different than, than SWIFT. They perform the different functions between a debit card being retail and SWIFT being more what I would call commercial. If a bank issues a stable coin, that stable coin could operate much like a debit card, where a central digital might operate more like, like SWIFT. So when you start talking about regulations, and I know that the, the department, the U.S. department is working on regulations around, quote, stable coins, but they're not really making distinctions of what that function is. You know, so Norma, do you have any insights on some of that? Sure. So the Department of Treasury has actually been working very hard across all the independent financial regulators to actually make clear the differences between stable coins, digital assets, CBDCs and other things. You know, the concept of a digital asset has existed for quite some time. Right. A, a card, as you're talking about, the digital asset. So I, I, I don't think what we're talking about is having an individual bank in the United States 
randomly issue a stable coin. What we're trying to do in the president's working group um, from the Treasury Department is trying to maintain some structure and definitions and regulatory processes around that. So as we talk about the issue of stable coins, what the Treasury Department is worried about is really three or four main things, right? They're talking about systemic payment risk. They're talking about stable coin runs, and they're really talking about concentration of economic power. And so the report that the Treasury Department put out on stable coins uh, just last fall basically said it, especially in the case of the U.S., Congress needs to issue uh, promulgate legislation that provide clear definitions around the use of stable coins. The other part is making sure, and, and their recommendation in the legislation is that only um, that only certain institutions would be allowed to issue stable coins. So they do not want um, private entities necessarily issuing stable coins. They're worried about consumer protection issues. And so if someone buys a stable coin, do they actually know what that valuation is? We just heard about that. Um, and there are many other, I think, um, challenges that we have in the United States around digital assets and cryptocurrencies. And I'll just mention two quickly, and we can go in whatever direction that we want. But we do need some distinction in the United States about um, who has the ability to issue stable coins, who has the ability to actually issue and manage cryptocurrencies. But there's also a difference between a digital asset that might be considered a security by the Securities and Exchange Commission, right, or... Um, in the scope of the CFTC. So I think when we talk about these issues today, we probably need to be very clear about what term that we're using um, because they all, the good news is that they've all evolved into something very distinct. And the U.S. has been working with the G7, G20, and OECD to bring some clarity to all of that. Yeah, and that's where I think some of the distinctions going to end up. We did this in Malta, Bermuda, now we're working on Abu Dhabi. That was why I asked a, a, a Debit card equals a stable coin. Central digital acts a lot like SWIFT. Utility tokens act more like a gift card. A lot of cryptocurrencies actually act more like a penny stock or an, or an OTC offering. And, and an NFT kind of fits in the middle. So I, I think the regulatory side is really important for where the distinctions will lie because banks don't regulate gift cards. You know, banks don't regulate stocks. Stocks fall under a different different jurisdiction. <clears throat> so the regulation's important, I think. Where do you believe anybody want to take this one? Where should the regulators fall in terms of what the banks would do in issuing a, a stable coin? If the bank's going to issue a central digital based on deposits, there's not a lot of regulatory in terms of the issuance of it, how the usage of it, the, the, the usage in terms of the programmable money aspect opens a whole different, you know, set of circumstances. But from a regulatory standpoint, is there any reason really the government should be looking to regulate banks on a stable coin or a central digital banknote? Uh, I would like to take a step on this. Uh, first, uh, you know, within the crypto community, there are different school of thought. Some would like to be on the, reg on the regulation. Some do not want to be regulation. So this, you know, starting from the beginning origination of a coin is anti-government, right? We do not want to be regulated by government, any government. So, but ho however, things, you know, evolve over the time. Some want to become a bridge between the existing uh, uh, system, which is regulated in most countries, not all countries. And some stayed in the, in the space, which is totally outside of the regulatory system. Some completely move into the regulatory system. So within the crypto community, there are at least three uh, type of groups. And then come to regulation. Then we're talking about global stage. There is U.S. regulation, which is completely different from any other country. Uh, I have to say it's, it's the most uh, strict, stringent regulated uh, market. And then there is Asian, uh, which is China itself is one, you know, Singapore and then uh, Korea is a major uh, player too. And in Middle East is also very open uh, from regulation standpoint and Europe is different. So, uh, so I would say, um, you know, First, not all the crypto company want to be or are in the regulatory. Number two, um, not all the company within the U.S. regulatory uh, space. So I, I think that's kind of give the space for the remaining um, panel. Uh, if we want to discuss U.S. regulatory, no regulatory or uh, other regulatory. Well, but again, this is where it belies distinction. The U.S. regulations really should be a need to be more around the use of, of crypto assets for fundraising. 
if we're talking about a stable coin within a bank jurisdiction, well, there, there is no regulation per se other than I, I think, again, my, my, my concern on stable coins is the programmable aspect when the government can then say, you know, you must do this. If you want health insurance, we turn off your money here. If we you know, want you to take a vaccine or not, like the programmable side is where the regulations haven't gone, but possibly should. If we're talking about regulating crypto assets as a form of how it's done globally to raise money, th- that's a whole different si- circumstance. So- uh, for, I, I work with all the capital markets uh, just before. First, not all the countries have regulation on securities. Number two, U.S. Uh, jurisdiction have no rights over, like, say, China or in Middle East. So you have to make sure what kind of practice or select which jurisdiction you want to work with. Uh, U.S. law does not cover Russia right now, by the way. So, you know, just, just give you some idea. It's not yeah. a global law. There's no global jurisdiction. Right. The, so there's a couple of different things. You know, the G20, which does include China, has been very active on talking about, you know, what are, we need definitions for these things. Right. We could argue that a gift card is any single thing that we want. But from a, from a global regulatory perspective, no one is trying to say that a gift card is, you know, the solution to our problem, nor is it really a stable coin or is it, you know, it could be a digital asset or is it a, a token? I don't think that's really what the regulators are worried about. What, what G20, and I'll just stick with that because it's the largest group, is trying to say, let's be very clear about what our definitions are, where do they fit and how they should be regulated. Um, the United States or even in the G20, I don't think anyone is talking about regulating non-fungible tokens, NFTs. That's like a picture of a kitty cat, right? Yeah. No, actually yeah, they are. That- it just came out yesterday. The SEC is looking at regulation NFTs because they've been used for raising capital. Well, it, so, but, so again, but the, the, the SEC so in general is behind the, 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 of the, the current society, the right? Dip- I'm sorry. It's okay. No, no, no. We're in the same place. The difference is how is the token being used, right? It's about securities law. So what I'm saying is the definition, we need definitions for what each of these are and then what are their use cases, right? So it should be regulated by use case. If you're creating something that is being used as a security, and so far the SEC says that should be regulated as security versus in the derivative market. Correct. And that, that's where I'm hopeful, even in a panel like this, I'm big as well. We need to drive distinctions of definition. Even our panel was about embracing cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is such a broad specter of a conversation that, that there's a different use for a digital asset. And as these digital assets get better definitions, I think the regulations can get better formed around what to do. Um, Dave, question for you on that, because again, even we worked with El Salvador like a lot of people did. You know, this conversation around El Salvador using Bitcoin as a currency uh, was actually a misnomer. It's a form of payment, not a currency. But what's your feelings on on what happened in El Salvador and where that fits from a currency or regulation standpoint? I think it sh- sh- uh, shows in sharp relief the difference between that approach and a CBDC, and it shows the broad spectrum that you've got here. So CBDC takes two years to convince people we should kick off a pilot and we hire a consulting firm and we spend two to three years testing it. And then we spend five years figuring out a regulation and building it and a couple years rolling it out and 10 years go by. Um, If you're lucky, the middle ground is is stable coins. So, hey, maybe we don't build one, but we put regulatory framework in so they act sort of like it and have the same utility and same protections for businesses and consumers and protect people. And then what El Salvador did was the radical other side, which is we have no time, we have no money, we ha- we don't have the ability to do any of those things. Let's make a thing that's already out there and make it so that it's, you know, it's taxed as a as a means of, tra- of transaction and not as a as a store of wealth, for example. And then let's put incentives and penalties that people can take it. And that's kind of the poor man's, if you will, um, approach. I thought it was interesting because I don't think anyone seriously considered that before they went and did it. So now we have a use case of it. I think it's fascinating. Do I think it's applicable for the world? No, but it might be for some smaller countries or at least somebody kicked it off and had the, you know, we get to watch it and see what happens. But I think it's amazing. At the end of the day, they're just doing a spot trade. They're just doing Bitcoin to to, to spot USD. Well, but, you know, also using lightning to, like, keep transaction fees down. And, I mean, there's some thought put into it, for sure. 
Yeah. So let's 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 spend a few minutes on this because I'd like to hear from each of you. And one of the the questions is really, you know, sort of the motivation. Let's talk about the positive aspect of of a stable coin. I'm going to define for this conversation a stable coin to me is like a debit card. You put a thousand dollars in, you get a debit card. You can spend it certain network. You put a thousand in. If banks were to issue a stable coin. What are the advantages within a network for, for either the holder of the coin or really for the merchant or the bank? And then we'll do central digital different. I think that's a little different. But from a digital standpoint for stable coin, if we correlate it to a debit card, what are the advantages or the reasons that, that the banking industry might want to do it? Well, I mean, the first one is that if you can make it work with all the existing credit and debit card terminals that are out there in the world, you get instant acceptance everywhere. All of these things have to be about acceptance, right? And they have to be about inclusion of the financial uh, sector, private sector, as well as the government. So I think, yeah, I mean, if you can use the existing infrastructure that's at your grocery store, boom, you win. And I think that's why we're seeing companies that are some of the bigger exchanges look to partner with the credit card networks to try to you know, sort of kludge something together now, which yeah. is you can get a crypto debit card. Uh, I know it's not exactly what you're talking about, but it's a similar type of concept. Yeah, um, interesting. I, Art, I, I, was, oh, go ahead, Norma. Because I was we, just going to say, I, I, go think, ahead. I think it's a tough premise. Banks are not going to just randomly issue stable coins that are equivalent to a debit card. So <laughs> I, I think just to sort of level set, that's just not going to happen, right? If the concept is that a stable coin... It, I can only speak in the United States. That's just not going to happen. If the concept, though, that a stable coin is tied to the U.S. dollar, to a fiat currency, right, you know, that then it's easier to understand what it would be. But I don't I think okay. as we as we talk about these issues, it may be easier also to stick to the cryptocurrency, the topic that we have, because that's a much easier discussion about regulatory structures, where people are going and then how, you know, global nations are working together to define what is a cryptocurrency and how it could be used. Okay, I, I agree, but technically it's not. We're dealing with one in the UAE right now that's looking to do a stable coin tied to their currency, not the base currency to the dollar. And the premise is they would rather have their 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 base, their their retail customers putting a thousand dollars in the bank to get a stable coin that could be used on a network versus doing it externally. So, so it's still going to be a way to increase deposits and keep right. them in and issue a different technology. But it's still going to be a one for one. It's still being tied to the current their currency. Correct. It's not tied to a U.S. Yeah, dollar for currency. It's tied to their base currency. But yeah, but the premise, their- yeah, the premise was the banks need to find ways to keep dollars in house versus them leaving out into an external third party network. And, and so that was where there's when the advantages for some of the banks that we're dealing with in the UAE. Or just about keeping deposits on. Um, let's go back to normal. Let's, if we want to stay on topic, rephrase the comment you made about our topic, and let's talk about that in the in the ten minutes or so we have left. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you as the moderator have the the, <laughs> the title to the panel, right? The goal is to talk about how countries around the world are looking at cryptocurrencies and how they might be issued. Correct. Right? So what let's switch into central is- digital because I said on the. Uh, on the stable coin side, I think banks are going to issue their own stable coin. It'll be easy. It'll be tied to their local currency. They'll encourage people to keep deposits on and the benefit will be faster through the network, lower transaction fees, all of that. There's not much of a distinction and it's going to happen. Uh, very simply. Okay. There's a, a, a I'm global. Uh, I mean, I, you do too, right? We're a global citizen. We live in different countries and uh, with the older system, right? We open bank accounts. So I live in Europe. It's, it's very difficult and time consuming and just, just headaches. Uh, with crypto, let's say I have a, a, a bunch of crypto open account here. I can use anywhere globally. I don't have to worry about the you know, FX open bank account. The U.S. Uh, has a lot of, you know, ish, I mean, a lot of risk. Like as a U.S. citizen, it's very, very difficult to go open account in a different country. So uh, so we can bypass, make our life easier for day to day. And then uh, and uh, right now, with, you know, since the civil war, I mean, it was not, the war is going on Russia and the Ukraine. Um, if just stay with these two countries or not trigger any bigger uh, scale uh, wars, um, then 
I mean, for the people from these two countries, right? Then they because the Russian money is frozen right now, so they, if they have crypto, then they can still you not know, maintain a day-to-day that kind of like working capital for their daily life. So these are the benefits with uh, cryptocurrency, just for normal, not not talk about making money, you know, as as trading uh, perspective. So that's one thing. Second is kind of joke, again, kind of joke. Uh, central bank can print out as much money they want. Crypto mm-hmm. cannot. <laughs> okay, I know, I know here. <laughs> Um, I don't know why they they can't. It, crypto can print out whatever they want, depending on how the network is. But that'll 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 take us down a whole different, you know, Route, whole yeah. different conversation. Yeah. Um, you know. So again, we're we're trying to figure out our current currencies. Again, the panel when I worked with Frank on this, the term cryptocurrency is acceptable, even for our panel. I thought was a was a challenge. Let's talk about the the last part on the government side. Then, the benefit of a government going to Central digital banknotes, whether it's security with KYC AML, whether it's the more efficient ability to transfer money between parties. Where do we think the country is like, let's talk U.S. first. Where's the U.S. going to fall on a on a on a central digital banknote based on what you know within the, the Treasury conversations? Start with Norma on that one, obviously. Yeah, I would say this. You know, I think Secretary Yellen, Treasury and the independent regulators are have been much more open about what a CBDC could look like. What are the considerations for moving in that direction? Certainly cybersecurity, basic security issues, I think are very important. And they have talked about global interoperability, right? I, I think that, you know, the, the benefit to these conversations is that we have a global trading system now, global monetary system. And so if we all go to a CBDC, you just need interoperability for that. I do think that there are questions again around AML and KYC that exists, whether it's CBDC or crypto or, or any construct. And that's that just means we have to evolve with that to understand what security means. And we have the Foreign Assets Task Force, FATF, who have been looking at in, uh, new AML, well, not so new anymore, AML and KYC protections. And, and I think people are just saying if we go to a CBDC, we need a similar construct for the global movement of money uh, and digital assets. And so I think the U.S. is a little behind Other countries have been more forward leaning on this, but I think Secretary Yellen is sort of pulling everybody in the right direction. um, And it will be a good discussion, at least in the U.S. Yeah. Dave or Josh, one of you guys want to take that because I know you're both kind of in this space as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from uh, my side, that's, you know, what we observed uh, that, you know, central banks, when they issue central bank digital currency, Mostly that uh, they come from, you know, different problems they're facing using central bank digital currency as a potential innovation to address the challenge. The policy goals which we have seen that central bank have talked about uh, include like, uh, you know, financial inclusion, modernizing the payment system, uh, deal with the friction of uh, cross, cross-border payment, and also address the potential fraud and, uh, you know, those are the really the pain points the central banks worldwide are seeing that the current, uh, you know, the, the, the system uh, have and where that central bank is, uh, central bank digital currency is being used to really solving, trying to solve one, one or multiple problem they are identifying. So from our side, you know, basically, number one is if you choose one or multiple policy objective, then the technology piece that you choose will also have to be aligned with the policy goals. And uh, otherwise, you know, for example, if you want to just use central bank digital currency to address innovation, where that's, uh, you know, the central bank digital currency is not a program, all other fintech company cannot really leverage CBDC for innovation, then, you know, the technology and the, all the solution and the problem statement doesn't match. This is one example. Whichever policy goals that central bank need to address, they need to really align the the, the technology piece with with the policy piece. Yeah. Dave. So I agree with both uh, both of the speakers. Um, it's still split to me whether they're going to actually build central bank digital currency in the United States or whether they're going to rely on stable coins that are highly regulated under OCC or Treasury or a variety of those organizations for the different functions. Um, I say it because uh, 
there's so much infrastructure that has to be built if you do a CBDC. So, you know, I, this idea of cross-border is important, interoperability is important, but global acceptance is important as well. You have to be able to go to a store and say, I have this card and I need to use it now, or I have my wallet and I've got to use it. So global acceptance is critical as well. As And to bring up um, some of the examples uh, around uh, yeah, that Norma brought up around KYC, that's not central bank's job. They're not set up to do it. Um, that's private industry's jobs. That's banks' jobs and others is to identify people and according to their risk. So I, I honestly think the easier way out, this is just my personal opinion, is to regulate stable coins and they're already interoperable and um, you got a lot of privacy benefits. And as long as KYC is enforced at the onboarding points of those, which are exchanges largely, potentially banks, then I think you've covered it. But my personal opinion, not my corporate opinion. <laughs> yeah, just two, two more, two pieces of additional information about U.S. Just the U.S. Uh, Federal Board, uh, Reserve Board, just issued a CBDC uh, consultation paper and uh, looking for input from the public. And also Boston Fed just, you know, uh, issued the, the uh, uh, summary or result report of the CBDC pilot that they did with all research they did with MIT. And that's just a really, you know, uh, dis described uh, in very detailed uh, U.S. approach from the Fed perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And that, again, that's where I, I, I like the distinctions. And I think it's important if, if the distinction of a stable coin is more akin, not exactly, but more akin to debit card retailer, that's more KYC, know your customer AML. If a central bank note is similar to the SWIFT network, well, that's more KYB. That's know your business or know your bank, where now you've got interoperability among 11,000 banks doing bank settlement, which is different than stable coins doing retail settlement. But what why would they you? kick out SWIFT when it already works? Right. People have been trying to quick kick out SWIFT for years. I mean, for yeah. how long? Um, and, and others, they, there's a bunch of others that have been trying to do that. They've gone nowhere. I mean, Swift right, does. Right. I, I used to. I, I sold a lot of product to Swift. I've been to Swift many times in different countries, and uh, play, yeah. and well, you we, know, we, some of my friends work there. I just, I think they they've been trying to keep up and and keep up that backbone. Why would they move away? I, I, the other piece, maybe just stepping back a little bit, when when we when this topic is discussed, the topic writ large. Again, I'll just stick with the G twenty. You know, what global nations are are trying to understand is to help still address the unbanked and the bankless, right? We worry about financial yeah. inclusion. Um, we worry about kind of digital education and technology. And so the pro is if you have, I mean, these systems have to be interoperable around the world, but you could be wherever you need to be and have access to your money. Yeah. You know, right. but what we are talking about with that financial inclusion is also making sure that there is consumer protection in there. So not every consumer is as well versed maybe as all of us on on you know this event today to understand what a stable coin is or isn't. You know, if they're buying cryptocurrency, what value does it really have? Do people really understand that? And these are these are really important conversations that we certainly have in the US Congress, but we're having around the world, which is what is that balance? Right. We don't want to create um, crypto, whichever term makes us happy. We don't want to create the elite of the elite who are the only ones who understand how these systems work. Um, and I think that's really where the consumer education piece is really important. And the, and the consumer protection is not just about making sure that we're helping protect people's money. But when we talk about the cybersecurity risks to any digital pick your term. You know, that's a big deal. Um, and the fact that FDIC in the United States ensures up to a certain point gives people comfort. And so, again, I think these are topics that we have to talk about just globally to help make people understand that they can be comfortable with whatever a new system is. But those protections have to be clear. Yeah, I, well, I, think, I think the comfort is is important. I think the distinctions and the definitions are are the critical side that the industry is still going through. Let's uh. Let's let's go around and wrap up, uh, you know, one or two minute closing thoughts or comments. Let's I don't know how you guys can see it on screen. Let's start with Dave and we'll just go around. Any any last comments, closing ideas, thoughts? 
Actually, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna hand mine over to Lee because she had some things she wanted to say, okay. and so. <laughs> all right. Uh, I guess I, I, you guys are more on the regulatory side, especially from U.S. regulatory. I'm very again. I'm very global citizen, and I'm more from the company standpoint. What we're trying to do is build a community. Uh, the community may not be liked by one certain country or some countries. However, we're trying to create our sub community basically. So uh, is. Some may be covered by regulations. Some we may want to avoid regulation. Some we may uh, doing something without regulation, and then regulation come out later, right? So from the from the the company standpoint, the builders in uh, in uh, the creator standpoint, um, we are not trying to break any laws. However, we're trying to build a community, different from government. So so that's kind of the a lot of drive of these kind of things pops out. And um, uh, of course, regulation come come out later, trying to control this community, which we don't we don't want to be controlled. So that's the a big part of the crypto community, particularly the ones outside the United States. And then uh, and 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 then of course, U.S. government trying to uh, regulate these activities um, uh, to remain in control of the currency, um, particularly for the U.S. jurisdiction. So my my conclusion is the world is very different. U.S. government regulation, which is, is in the good sense, trying to protect uh, consumers, uh, has certain, uh, uh, you know, um, certain uh, market uh, uh, to control, and they're trying to, gain, you know, learn the new technology, getting better on that. However, definitely, that's way behind the current market is. Uh, that's kind of where I want to uh, end up, end up here. Yeah. Okay, Norma. Here I'll go last. I've talked a lot. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, it's for, for me that I think I want to just bring back that, so, you know, the, the, the cryptocurrency acceptability that, you know, where did the uh, stablecoin come from? And uh, so I think that's uh, um, number one, that is currently stablecoin still being used the most for crypto related transaction. And the reason why stablecoin was born is really because that's, you know, in the crypto space, when the, the two parties want to do transaction and then they also, you know, then there's a transaction which they really want to just deal with the fluctuation related problem. And then they, that's the really the, the core demand when stablecoin was really just being introduced to the market. And then at that time, that was purely the problem was nothing to do with the physical world. It's really purely for the crypto or digital world. That was, you know, where it come from. Then, you know, when we just look at it, it's called a sta stable coin. The stability is, you know, coming or uh, uh, stem from different uh, sources. Some are packed with the currency, some, you know, gold backed, uh, index backed, you know, different type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, mechanism or, or business model around stable coin, which just uh, really define, you know, what uh, are the, you know, source of their stability. And then there, that's actually, you know, the regulators in different countries. Uh, regulated differently and uh, if you feel packed with money if you're packed with uh, you know gold if you then you know you then the the, the the regulation will come from different way now that currently that we see many you know other uh institutions uh, you know uh, who are operating in the physical world started to trying to see to build the connection between the physical and the digital that's uh, you know this becoming a issue but again that's uh, currently when you look at a stable calm all the stable coins are really issued, uh, you know, the, especially the majority, the, the major ones, uh, really by the tech company, not by, you know, a bank or a, a, anything. But it's a still, it's the private money. Then compare that with the central bank digital currency, that's a central bank digital currency is really public money and the leverage, uh, you know, uh, is on central bank's uh, uh, balance sheet. And where that it gave the, 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 CBDC different kind of credibility and, and 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 all that. So that's I think which you know when we as no matter business or as individual when you just look at what you know currency you accept and I think that will just be very important to 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 be in mind and what use case you're looking at and what problem that you know you you try to solve with the the, the payment yeah. Dave, go ahead. We'll let Norma close it out. Great, thanks. Well, the uh, I think the the interesting thing is we are at an amazing point here where we've got governments experimenting with Bitcoin 
uh, to do payments. We're talking about stable coins and regulations there. Others are going all the way to CBDCs. We've got a sanctions war in the middle of a hot war. Um, mm -hmm. Everything's changing so quickly. Uh, so I don't have any answers on, but you know, what we do at CypherTrace and MasterCard is we have a set of guiding principles around how we think about stable coins and, 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 um, and CBDCs. And I think as long as we have the right principles and are working together as a community, we'll, we'll, the right things will come about. And, you know, we have seven principles, but some of them are innovation. This isn't going to, you know, stop here. Um, open acceptance, interoperability. Um, these are important things. And then regulations as appropriate and needed based on the risk and not just because um, because we can, and then underlying it with consumer and business confidence. If we keep those as pillars, I think we'll, you know, we'll navigate through these interesting times. Well, that I'll say that was perfect to you because, you know, really my, what I wanted to focus on as we close out is what we're really talking about is a change in global monetary policy, right? And it is important that we have a global conversation about what that means. Um, I don't think it's just a U.S. perspective, but we have to have interoperability. Um, we do need to make sure that we are clear about what what the asset is being used for, right? And that's both for consumer protection issues, but to understand where it fits in a regulatory scheme. We don't need to overregulate. Things that are not a security do not need to be regulated as a security, you know, whether it's here or somewhere else. But understanding the value and making sure that consumers are protected and knowing if they're investing in whichever tool, crypto, virtual, token, NFT, that they actually are protected in that. So, you know, the end of the day, the hardest part, and we don't, as Steve said, we don't have to solve these problems. We want to support global innovation, but that does operate in a global monetary system that include protections. And so it is a balance between, you know, I call it the fintech upstarts, you know, the legacy banks and all those things. But we have we have great opportunity. We should focus on those opportunities uh, and to find the best way forward. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. We'll wrap up here pretty quickly. The term I use when I, we deal a lot with the regulators, uh, I call it retrospective evolution. It's like, how can we look backwards that what's worked and then how do we overlay it with new technology where, where we use the, the technology to its advantage going forward, but we learn from what's worked in the past. So just got the note from Frank. Our time's up. So thank you to everybody. You guys, great job. Appreciate it as always. And, and stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your day and go change the world. Take care, everybody. Right, bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye.